this morning, I would like to uh, talk about some of the athletic metaphors that Paul used to describe our Christian life, okay? Let's uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> and we will start reading from verse 24. Uh, maybe some of you have seen the movie the gladiator, uh, Russell, Russell Crowe. And it shows there that the gladiators were fighting to survive in the Roman arena. But a gladiator in the Roman times is actually an athlete. It's not true that uh, at, at the whims of a leader, they'll just die. No, these, these gladiators, even if they are wounded, especially if they are great, their masters will try to nurse them back to health so they can fight again. So they are, they are basically athletes. That's why you will find that in the scriptures, the metaphors that Paul used in reference to Christian life is that of a gladiator, a uh, marathon runner, a wrestler, and all of those uh, figures of his speech that describes how we should live our Christian life. And sometimes, of course, in modern term, you can, even, you can even put it in a boxing arena or a boxing match. They normally hold a lot of their activities in a gymnasium. A gymnasium was a university in those days. The, it's a very exclusive society. It's a, it's a very exclusive club. Very different from, from a, a gymnasium today. A gym today is just an exercise center. In those days when you are doing something in the gymnasium, they're just all naked in all of those things, but of course not, not in today's uh, society. This metaphor is important because of the concept of victory or winning a race. When you win a race, there is a prize at the end. <clears throat> there, is an <coughs> there is an anticipated reward. Only one gets to win. Now, I don't know how, how far we will push this metaphor in Christian life because all of us are supposed to win. But in a race, only one is supposed to win. Big difference between, for example, Philippine athleticism and U.S. is here, for example, in the NBA, you only have a finals between two contending teams. In the Philippines, the finals will be for a championship in the third place. And there is a trophy for the champion, for the, for the second place, and the third place. Here, the trophy is only given to the winner. Well, biblically, in a, in a natural uh, event, only one winner. Okay? Now, to introduce that, for you to, to put yourself in a position to win, there has to be a, a lot of self-control and self-constraint that needs to take place. That's why Paul used a lot of uh, athletic metaphor in his writings to describe our lives. So let's, let's uh, look at 1 Corinthians 9.24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Only one. Run in such a way that you may win. So this is our calling, to run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Say self-control. So now, whenever Paul used the, met the athletic metaphor, he's also emphasizing self-control. Because that is basically what athletes have to have, a lot of self-control. <clears throat> they then do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we are imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way. Paul already sh shifted from the natural to the spiritual. Then he said, therefore, I run, going back to the metaphor, in such a way as not without aim. I box, second metaphor, 
in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body. So three things. I run, I box, I discipline my body. He's now referring to his flesh. And make it my slave. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Now look at this strong statement. Paul said, I, I run, I box, I discipline myself. Because if I don't, at the end, I may be disqualified. Now he's not talking about salvation here. He's, he's talking about the prize of a, of a Christian who runs the race. I may be disqualified. Disqualified from what? From the race. All of us are involved in a race. And if we don't practice self-restraint or self-control, we don't have to have anybody censuring us or disqualifying us. The real person who disqualifies himself or herself is you. Okay? It's just you. Okay? We, we found a lot of... There, there's a very famous athlete in the Philippines in, back in the days, over maybe 30 years ago. He's in a wheelchair. Now, I, I don't know if he already died. Sam Boylin. Remember Sam Boylin? Yeah, yeah. Sam Boylin was a phenomenal basketball player. I mean, during the time that the Philippines was involved in an international competition, they were the champion. He has a lot of uh, black athletes in his team, but he shined above all of them. He was invited by the NBA for a tryout. The problem with Sam Boy Lim is he doesn't know how to fall. He doesn't know how to land after he, he jumps high and, and, and made the dunk. He doesn't know how to, how to take care of himself. Norman Black, his coach, at one time told him, you've got to study judo. And he asked why. He said, he, he said you, you don't know how to fall. As an athlete, you've got to know how to fall. And so he, end, he ended his career prematurely. He's always injured. And it turned out his diet, his self-discipline in terms of taking care of his body physically was not at its best. Therefore, everybody loves him. If you have seen some of his clips when he was young, he was, he was a thing to watch. Everybody wants to watch him. And no, every, every team wants to get him. Nobody was disqualifying him. But at the end, he disqualified himself. He, he's, I, I, I think he's still alive. He got born again. Okay? But being born again did not restore his career because he's, he's just messed up physically. And I, I like this metaphor because I think it describes what we as Christians go through. First of all, there is only one race that all is running on. Not two races, only one. If you are not on it, you're in a wrong race. So you may say, well, I'm doing this. If it's not in the will of God, if it's not within the confines of Christian witness, you're in a wrong race. And some, some, uh, some Christians end up trying to uh, do a lot of things, a lot of activities. It's a wrong race. It's just a wrong race. Uh, I, was, I was reading one, one uh, I don't know if it's, if it's a, a joke or a reality, but I think it's a true story. One of those marathons, not in America. And, and this athlete was a phenomenal runner. He got lost. There was a wrong turn. He got lost. He doesn't know the trail. He was running so fast. I don't know if the story is true. He was running so fast. It's in the third world. There were no, you know, no guides. He, he was in a... I said, where, where will I turn? I said, there are like three different directions. He took the wrong turn. And he lost the race. He was the fastest of them all. He lost the race. Why? He was running on a wrong race. And I hope nobody here is running on a wrong race. Because you can run as fast as you can, spend all the energy that you want if you are in a wrong race. Then you're not going to be able to win the prize. In the natural, there is only one winner. What about in the spiritual? We'll learn that uh, next time we talk, okay? So in this letter that we read, Paul showed that his brand of Christianity 
is not complacency but commitment. To be a runner, to be a boxer, to be a wrestler, it's not complacency. When Rolando Navarrete captured the, uh, I don't know what division it was, he, he, uh, he took it from Bazooka Limon. And the story was similar to Manny Pacquiao taking it from, from whoever that was. Because Navarrete was also a shoe-in. The, uh, the qualifier could not fight, so they put him in, in a, in a quick notice. The problem with Navarrete is this. He doesn't have his, his, his scattered brain in lack of discipline. When he landed in, in the Philippines after winning a championship, I was, uh, I was uh, doing my workout back then at, at, at the Philippine Columbian Club. And some of the people with him was working out with me. And they said, they were very proud, you should have seen the amount of booze that he brought with him. From the airport, he landed, had cases of, of imported uh, liquors, and went directly to partying. He ruined himself. If you're going to be an athlete, you cannot drink. You cannot smoke. You cannot just eat anything you want. You cannot just sleep anytime you want. My, my wife was telling me because her, her dad used to be a boxing promoter. She said, our boxers eat better than we do. I mean, their, their time to sleep is regulated. Their time to wake up is regulated. Everything is regulated. If you don't allow yourself to be restrained like that, forget boxing. Because in, in a, in a uh, moment of, of disadvantage for some kind of prison, you can, have, you can have yourself killed. Now, we are called to witness. So this is not complacency and commitment. There, has also, there needs also to be an eagerness and sustained effort. You, you, cannot, you cannot practice right now and decide, I'm... I'm, I already practice. I'm not going to practice for the next month. Michael Jordan said one of the athletes in the NBA that we never really saw the full potential was Charles Barkley. He said, I have never seen anybody as, as talented as Charles Barkley, never won a ring. Michael Jordan said this because the guy does not really practice. He loves to party. He lacks the discipline. You see? And so he, he, never, he never made it to, to win a ring. And, and so he's one of those sports anchors that says it's not really, it doesn't really matter if you don't get a ring. Of course it does. Because that's what you are fighting for. There is a prize. That's why you restrain yourself. You need, you need to be able to maintain spiritually, spiritual values and, and, and uh, strict training and discipline. I was, I was watching the preparation between Pacquiao and Mayweather, and this is modern athleticism. Man, that guy will wake up, Mayweather, probably Mayweather, I think at 4 a.m. at one time to have, how do you call it, Nit nitrogen therapy or something. Before, and and it's, it's a very cold temperature where you have to subject yourself for, for, for around a minute or two, and, and so that their bodies will heal. And I was looking at that, and I said, I don't even like the weather in Chicago, you know? And, and you will subject yourself to, to uh, that kind of therapy where it's very cold just to get themselves healed. This, this, in, in fact, for lack of better terms, sometimes these are, these are like uh, uh, animals in competition. Horses that are being fed properly, being given treatment. I mean, everything is regimented. What this means is we need to know where we stand. We need to know when to say yes and when to say no and not be swayed by the world. When, when Joseph was trying to lose his 70 pounds, I, I, like, I like teasing him because he can bloat uh, so fast. And so when he was really trying to, to uh, shed his weight so that he can, he can be qualified for the Air Force, I would, I would buy ice cream. I'll put all kinds of, of trims in it, on it, and, and I'll eat it in front of him. 
and, and Joseph will buy, you know, from Costco, that, that container of greens, spinach, and all those things. He will not even put dressing. I said, you're, you're eating like a horse. Because he will just take the greens and put it in his mouth. I said, what in the world is that? No, no flavoring. He said, I, I cannot, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, eat what you're eating, Papa. And then he will wake up sometimes at 5 in the morning because he's going to run for, for 10 miles. And then sometimes he will run again in the evening. And I watch him for a couple of months just do this regimen. And he shed off the weight. Yeah. But, but I, can, I can offer him Coke. Uh, I can offer him all the nice things that we eat before. And he eats a lot of it. When it's time for him to, to be competitive, he said, no. That is self-control. Okay, that is self-control. And that is what Paul used to talk about winning in our Christian life. There are certain things that if we look at the athletic metaphor, you've got to say yes and no. This is where uh, we, can, we can relate to in our daily lives. Otherwise, we may find ourselves disqualifying ourselves. Okay? There, there is a, there's an athlete in, in where I grew up, uh, Name is Santiago. I think he played, he played for Pure Foods or something like that. He's younger. We call him Jack. And, and uh, there's another athlete in our place that is better than him, taller than him. I mean, a little bit taller than me, but he can slam the ball. He's really good. But he's a drunkard. And he's a thief. Okay. In the Philippines, when, when there is a fire, whatever they're doing, they drop it. They like to go they're volunteer firefighters. And it turned out because when they, when they try to put up the fire, they're actually trying to find the treasures in the house. That's what they do. And, and he tried to, he's, he's a very good athlete. When we play, he's really good. He said, he looked at Jack and said, Jack made it to the PBA. I can make it because he's a lot better than him. So he tried out at the uh, University of the East to become a varsity player. First round. He got knocked out. He doesn't have the stamina. If you look at him physically, he looks good. I'm telling you, this guy is not even six foot tall. He can slam the ball. I've witnessed him do it several times. This guy is good. But he doesn't have the discipline. Yeah, could not make it. Did the, did the basketball world disqualify him? No, he disqualified himself. A lot of the things that we say are prejudicial against us is actually not against us. It's us against ourselves. The greatest battle that we have is not against flesh and blood. It's against ourselves. Yeah. If come to think about it, the devil is not even the problem. He's already defeated. Yeah. I was talking to one military guy, and he said, uh, I, I, I think I was sharing this last, last uh, Friday, uh, he's in charge, he's in charge of one of these planes that in, a, in an event of nuclear explosion, it'll fly. There are tons of those airplanes. The, uh, the U.S. Navy has 18 of them. That's just the Navy. The Air Force have some of them, the, uh, the, the Army has some of them, they'll, they'll fly. And only one needs to survive. If it survives, it can communicate to all the nuclear submarines. It can, nuclear the, uh, it can, it can communicate with the president of the U.S. And, and the military operation will, will commence. When, when I, I look at that, boy, the discipline that they have. It's, it's, it's almost unbelievable. Now, you cannot be sleeping on duty. You cannot be in a moment's notice. They, they, can, they can fly. And you look at that and say, wow. We watch the television, we watch documentaries. I would like to do that. You wish. You wish. If you don't have the discipline to study, if you don't have the, the discipline to do all of those things, you can only wish. You cannot qualify. 
Not that they don't like it. You disqualify yourself. You see? So in a Christian race, it's not... Nobody is prejudiced against us. Nobody. Even if some are, because they are sinful, it doesn't matter. Who will really disqualify you is yourself. Okay? If you don't have the self-restraint. This brings us back to the issue of lifestyle. An athlete lives a different lifestyle. Rest differently. It's differently than those who are not athletes. Now, I'm not an athlete, okay? So I eat whatever I want. But even if I am not an athlete, I cannot just really eat whatever I want. Otherwise, I'll die young. Okay, I have, I have, I have to think of my young, younger kids. I have, I have to think about the treasures that God gave me, the revelations. If, if I am, if I am, an undisciplined minister who doesn't take care of his body, I can be very, very sick. And uh, it doesn't matter if I have revelation, I will not be able to share it. There has, there has to be some kind of, of, of discipline. Now, you need to maintain as an athlete a competitive edge. And that means you've got to be able to say no or yes to certain, to certain things. This also brings us to the point to be, to be a, an athlete it brings with it certain temptations. If you are an athlete today, uh, I mean, if, if you are a male athlete and you're making millions of dollars, a lot of girls will swoon around you. you know? And sometimes, you know, I hear a lot of cases about this, about that. Personally, I, I really don't believe a lot of those. Why? Because they say it happened 10 years ago. Why did you bring it up now? Oh, it's a super millionaire now, you know. I need, I, need, I need some of the money. Some of them are true. And the sad thing is, some that are true can be covered by these uh, malintentions. Okay? But, if, if you are going to be, you know temptations are going to be there. Temptations. I, I told you about my compadre, uh, PBA athlete. He said, we win a game in the Philippines, we go to the nightclub, he said, any girl you want, you get. That's what he said. Any drink you want, it's free. Because they win. And the, the team even pays for some of it. Yeah. What happened to him? Well, he became addicted to drugs. And did not make it to the NBA. You know what he's doing right now? He's an Uber driver. Oh, no, no, no more Uber in the Philippines. It's a... Uh, Grab. He's a grab driver now. And he heard that I had been going back and forth to the Philippines. He said, oh, tell, uh, by, by the way, two of them, two, two of my compadres are like that. They were former PB players. Now they are, they are grab drivers. Yeah. And uh, they never really made it on top because they lack the discipline. Karim Abdul-Jabbar was uh, about to retire and uh, A.C. Green was a power forward for the L.A. Lakers. A.C. Green is a question. And he maintained that when he retired from the NBA, he was a virgin. He never got involved. Uh, you, you read books about the Lakers, everybody will tell you that when they win and they are partying, A.C. Green will stay in his room. He will not get drunk. He will not uh, take any girls. He maintained he's a virgin. Outstanding testimony. After, after Magic Johnson was diagnosed with HIV virus, it's A.C. Green who brought him to the Lord. Okay? Now, what happened was, there was these young athletes who claimed to be Christians. And they are loud and, and uh, boisterous. And Karim Abdul-Jabbar, the oldest in the team, was in the locker room. And this newly drafted athlete was, I'm a Christian, and this and that. And he was telling everybody. And Karim Abdul-Jabbar looked at him and said, young man, unless you can leave like A.C. Green, you shut up. Yeah. Because he witnessed with, with uh, consistency that A.C. Green lived right. You know. And he witnessed also with regularity 
how some people who claim to be Christians go off the grid. Now, I understand this. If, if, this, if this metaphor is, is used, it carries along with it some of the substance of this metaphor. If you are a good athlete, you will be adored by some, even, even worshipped by some. I've, I've seen some, some jerseys for the New England Patriots fan. It says on number, on, at the back, number 12. You would expect the name should be Brady. The name is God. And you will see that in, uh, in, in uh, documentaries. Because they admire him so much, they put God. Uh, he won the most, nobody had won more Super Bowl as an individual than him. You know, in single team. And so they put number 12, Patriots, God. Because you will be worshipped if you are so good in anything that you do. There has to be self-restraint. You get to realize who, who, who you are. So what realities or knowledge does this statement teach us? First of all, anyone can be tempted and fall into sin. Anyone, all of us can be tempted and fall into sin. I, I don't really have, I, I was meditating on this one. I really don't know how to put this. So let's just, let me, let me just put it this way. <laughs> Unfiltered. You have to have some holy self-mistrust. You know? You cannot trust yourself alone. Let, let, me, let me put it this way. Now, I'm a man. If you put me in a nightclub where there are strippers, let me ask you a question. Will I look? I'm your pastor. Okay, be careful how you answer. <laughs> so, you put me in a strip club. I know who among you will put me there, but you put me in a strip club. <laughs> so, I'm born again. I'm a minister. Will I look? Yes. How did you know? Empathically, yes. Because you have eyes. Because I have eyes. Now, if I ask myself, will I look? What do you think will be my answer? No. That's where you are wrong. I will look. <laughs> That's why I don't go. Yeah. Why will I look? Because of my flesh. I mean, I, I told you this. Before I got married, I told the Lord, Lord, give me a beautiful wife. You know. Of course, you're the judge of what is beautiful to you. But I told the Lord, I'll, I'll be ministering to a lot of people. I don't want an ugly wife. But that's honest to goodness prayer to the Lord. Because what if I have a wife that I don't want to look at? Because the Lord gave her to me, you know. And then, and then you look at the congregation, a lot of these beautiful women. Boy, the temptation will be high. And this is, there's a group of missionaries that came to our church from the U.S. And they said, the Lord, this was before Mayor Lim cleaned the red district in the Philippines. They said, the Lord called us to witness to the prostitutes to the red district in Manila. And my pastor said, well, how are you going to do it? They went to nightclubs. I think four or five of them, all males, all of them committed adultery. Yeah. So understand this. Again, I lack the, the vocabulary, okay, and, and the phrase to say this. You've got to mistrust yourself concerning these things. Do not brag. Because you are still in an unglorified flesh. I have seen some of the people who are trying to lose weight. Put them in a buffet. <laughs> or tomorrow na lang. <laughs> or next week. Because you don't under, you, 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 you misplace your trust in yourself. Your flesh uh, was so trained to eat everything that looks like food. You have, you have to stay away from those things. For, for example, uh, drunkards, they say, don't put me in a store 
where there's liquor, because the very smell at attracts me. They salivate. If you are uh, addicted to tobacco, do not go to a place where you can smell tobacco because there is an addictive element in its scent. Now, if you keep putting yourself in that one, you are trusting yourself too much and most of them fall. There was a police officer in the, in the Philippines, an usher in our church. The Lord delivered him from drunkenness. I told you the story. He was petitioned by his daughter to go to uh, Virginia Beach. He was living in Norfolk, Virginia. And his daughter, he, he asked his daughter, can you please help me get my social security card? Can you please drive me? I want to apply for a job. And his daughter, who is addicted to gambling, keep putting it off. No, dad, I, I can't provide for you. No, no, no. Well, he was in the house for around a month, I think. And he said, I'm not doing anything in the house. So one day he decided to walk and found out at the end of the street there was a 7-Eleven. He walked in and found that in 7-Eleven there's a lot of liquors. And he said, I look at those things. And he said, all memories came back. You know, the good old days. So he bought one bottle and because his daughter knows he's a Christian, he hid it under his bed. Until his bed is full of bottles. He became a drunkard again. You see? I think our mistake, the Bible says put your trust in God. I think our mistake is self-bragging. You know, when people warn you, I'm different. <laughs> you are a fool if you do that. Because as an athlete, you can be tempted. That's why when Michael Jordan was seeking his ring, I don't know if he continues that habit, he refused to go partying. He refused to do the following things. He wants the ring. To the, to the extent that his teammates thought he was a snob and aloof because he would not join them until he got the ring. You see? Listen to me. You can be tempted. You can be out of shape spiritually. And you can disqualify yourself. You cannot also... Live in isolation in order to avoid a temptation because you're a witness. We, uh, we mingle uh, with the crowd. Now, instead, we have to be able to relate with all without agreeing with their lifestyles. By the way, if, if you meet, meet an athlete, you respect them. Okay? You respect them. And you, you can't expect that they live a certain lifestyle. Okay? If you're an athlete and, and, and say you are, you're a famous athlete, and somebody, and you, you, are, you have fans, you know, and they like your signature, you know, and all of those things. So somebody told you, hey, listen, uh, let's, let's go. It's on me. Let's go get drunk. Let's, let's go to the nightclub. And the athlete says, oh no, it's bad for my health. I will not be able to compete. What will you say? I understand. They respect that because you are an athlete. But as an athlete, you've got to be able to say, to verbalize it, no. Now, if you say yes, they'll begin to think you're not serious with your athleticism. You are actually an undisciplined athlete. The world actually respects and honor a disciplined athlete because they're being paid tons of money to entertain do all of those things. There's this young titan of the New England Patriots who retired. The name is, is Gronkowski. The guy is a phenomenal titan. You have to grab him to pull him down. Sometimes you can't pull him down. His problem, he plays hard. And he parties hard, short career. His body can't sustain it, short career. On the other hand, you've got this old quarterback at the end of this year's season, he'll be 42, name is Tom Brady, highly disciplined. Been injured a few times, but highly disciplined. Everything is structured. The amount of calories he eats, the number of massage he gets on his body, everything, round the clock. 
everybody envies him because he surpassed everybody. Highly, highly disciplined. You see? Now, nobody is... is who, who is this, this guy uh, from, from, the, uh, from the Vikings? I don't know, from the Packers. Uh, Brett Favre, because of the way he played. He said, I get addicted to pain medication. You know? And he could have played a couple of more years, but he said, I get, I get addicted. I'm taking so much pain medication, he became dependent on it. And he admitted it in public. You see? But people, he, he could have still played a couple more years. But uh, there is not enough discipline. And then he drinks hard also. In verse, in verse uh, 26, we fight or we box. So we say it's a race, right? But in this metaphor, it's not only a race. Our contest is conflict. Now, if, if you are a boxer, you, you have to prepare yourself to be able to absorb blows. You can't be too cocky and say, I'm too fast. Nobody's going to get me. You've got, you've got to prepare yourself to receive blows because some punches will land on you. If some punches will land on you, you can lose. I was telling you about uh, Navarrete. He, he, he defended his title and he lost the title to this, to this Mexican fighter. Mexicans are known for their chin. They're, they have very strong chin. And in the beginning rounds, I think up to round eight or something, Navarrete was fast and, and was hitting this guy and he was hitting the head. Boy, he can, he can, he can hit the chin, but this Mexican fighter has a strong chin. Well, Navarrete is a drunkard. By round nine, he was tired. And this guy, though worn out, hit him, hit him in the head, fell, could not recover. Why? Because the Mexican athlete was more disciplined, and he had prepared himself to absorb hits. You see? Any, any fighter will tell you that. Part of their uh, uh, regimen is their being hit because they prepare themselves to absorb the hit. You see? They're not braggart saying, I can't beat. No, you, you've got... That's why if, if you, if you uh, touch the body, uh, super bantamweight champion taekwondo in the Philippines, <clears throat> was a member of our church, and he went on his own. And you know how in the Philippines we hit each other. I hit him once. Hey, how are you doing? I, I, I hit his abdomen. Nothing moved. It was solid rock. I said, whoa. I've never, heard, I've never touched such a hard, but I just went like this. It was super hard. He was super bantamweight champion in Taekwondo in the Philippines and in Asia. I don't know how much he ranked in the world. I think he was number two in the world during that time. But, but his exercises, I mean, he, he takes up his shirt. Sometimes he lead exercises when we are in camp. You, you will see the chiseled uh, six packs. You know. so, so most of us have a barrel, but he's got this real six packs. Discipline. Just discipline. And, and you, you cannot just hit him a little bit. He will not mind it. Okay, now, as Christians, with this wrestling competition that we are in, we will absorb pain. And that's part of our, of our journey. Therefore, we've got to discipline our, our, our bodies and, and we need to be able to, uh, to understand the limits of it. We do all of this self-restraint for a reason. We are not beating the air. You, you know this, when, when uh, Pacquiao knocked out uh, that English fighter, what is Hatton, second round, right? He said, it happened to his surprise. He said, we know exactly how he moved. And he said this, I didn't realize he was slower. <laughs> That's what Pacquiao said, he's, he's actually slower. So he said, that move that I made, we choreographed that because we know how he moved. He said, what surprised me is he was slower. Therefore, he cannot avoid my, my left hook. And he was hit right on the, 
on the jaw, and some people thought he died. It retired him. It retired him. You know. Why? Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman. What was what the rope dope of Muhammad Ali? But one of the things that Ali did is make a foreman beat the air. Athlete said, boxer says, that when you hit a target and you miss it, it takes a lot of energy to miss. That's why I think it was in round seven. Foreman hit Muhammad Ali and he ducked against the rope. And I thought Foreman is going to go over the rope. He was so tired. That's why I knocked him out on the eighth round. You see? Therefore, if you are an athlete, you have to have a discipline to be able to hit the target. Because if you cannot hit the target, it will waste your energy and it will discourage you. That's why I said earlier in the introduction, are you running the right race? Because you may be spending a lot of energy, but you are not accomplishing anything. What is very frustrating is you prepare to hit and you're not hitting anything. And you see athletes, boxers especially, lose discipline because they could not hit anything. Because you're in the wrong fight, you're in the wrong race, and, and uh, you're not prepared to, to hit any target. Therefore, as, as, as uh, this athletic metaphor shows, we need to be able to hit our targets. We get so discouraged when we keep saying, this is my goal, and we hit nothing. <laughs> we just hit nothing. We are all talk. You know, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna. That's why when people talk, it's not, uh, I'm not, I'm not easily impressed with that. Show me the results. Show me the results. You see, when during the interview between the last uh, fight of Pacquiao, uh, Thurman, right? The guy said, I'm going to retire Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao will just he smile there and say, We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Well, he knocked him down in the first round. We saw. But he just said, we'll, we'll see. He said, Monty Baseball, we'll see. He said, Well, we saw it. We saw it on the first round. And Joseph told me this because I think at one time Joseph and who's this guy? Uh, Alexis. They, they went to a UFC uh, match. And Joseph told me, Papa, I can't believe this. In the actual match, they are actually faster than on television. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, the camera could not capture the speed. He said, in actual fight, they are actually faster than, uh, than on television. So can you imagine what we may think is slow is actually fast. What we think is fast is faster. You see? But the guy keeps talking. But Pacquiao said, well, I know how to fight. I have beaten the best. And so he, has, he, said, and he said, we'll see. Well, we saw. And sometimes in Christianity, it's like that. We have a lot of people who talk. Hit nothing. That's why if you listen to people talk, you think they have conquered the world. Hit nothing. Uh, there was this a preacher that I used to listen to. Uh, he's a missionary in France. If you listen to him talk, I mean, there is massive revival in France. Believe me when I say this, there is no revival in France. It's one of the most dead, spiritually dead countries in the world. But whenever he, he talks, because he's the preacher, Boy, there's massive revival in France. No, there's not. Because when, when, when you have your meetings, you want to uh, exaggerate what's happening. You know, people brag, oh, they fall down, they roll down. That's not the issue. Do they stand up with a changed life? Because they can roll, they can vomit, they can jump, they can do all those things if when they stand up, their lives are not changed. You are beating the air. Because the real target is your life. That you have been changed by the power of God. Amen. That's why the mandate is discipleship, not evangelism. Going to all the world and make disciples. Not evangelize. We are counting decision cards. God is not. He is counting disciples, not decision cards. And so we have, we have to uh, understand 
that in, in the Christian contest, if you are, if you are a basketball player, you, you know, people are, 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 are saying, well, you, you know, uh, Stephen Carey is not athletic. Do you see him shoot? The goal of basketball is not to do all of those acrobatic moves. Yeah, you do all of those acro acrobatic moves and then you miss the ring. In the meantime, this guy didn't do the acrobatic move. He released the ball, nothing but net. That's athleticism. You know, I, I, I'm telling Joseph, people has got to redefine their terms because they say, well, Brady is not an athletic person. The guy has six rings. How much more athletic do you want to be? So here's this quarterback. He can run outside uh, and he can confuse people. The defense never have a ring. Always injured. Who's more athletic? The one who got the ring. Because the goal of that is to score touchdowns, win games, that's athleticism. You see? So some Christians, you find some Christians talk too much. No results. Huh? But there are some Christians who are very quiet, but they keep producing. You give them something to do, they do it. God gives them assignment, they accomplish it. These are the real spiritual athletes. We don't beat the air. There's got to be a goal. In verse 27, yeah, it sounds violent. He said, I strike, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me read it to you, okay? Verse 27. It says here, okay, it's fine. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be dis disqualified. Okay? What, what is, uh, what is the, the, the point there in, in verse 27? It sounds violent. Alternate translation reads, I strike under the eye. I beat myself black and blue. That's what, what the alternate translation reads. The end result is literally to make your body a slave. The same phrase was used. Remember the parable on the uh, woman, the importunate widow, who was telling the judge, give me justice. The English translation doesn't do justice as translation. Actually, the widow collared the judge and said, if you don't give me justice, I'm going to beat you black and blue. That's literally what it means. She, was, she became so violent that the judge was, was scared. I better give this woman justice. And we listen to athletes the way they discipline themselves, rain or shine. They say, what do you do? Enjoy. You know, have some, enjoy. Life is short. Enjoy. That's why you don't win anything. You know. But an athlete will sustain himself with discipline and self-restraint that it looks like they're slaves to their career. Actually, they love what they're doing. But they become slaves to their careers. Can you imagine these uh, this, uh, athletes? They are being told by their managers uh, when to sleep. They have curfew. Ann told me that when they had boxers before, they have curfew. And Ann says, they eat better than we do. Because they are prize, prize fighters. You are investing something in their, in their bodies. And so it sounds very violent. The end result is literally your body becomes your slave. You tell it what to do. Yeah. You tell it what to do. You know how, how uh, you will be tempted. I'll, 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 uh, one more hour. You know, you know how, your, how your kids, when they're doing homework, I told you a story years ago. Joseph was in elementary. And there was this show, a pilot. How do you call that when the first show of the season? Is it pilot? No, it's not. I mean, pilot is the first program. When second season, then the first show. There's a term for that. It's two hours. And I think it's going to go until around 10 p.m. And Joseph has homework. And he's got, he's got, household, he needs to do the dishes. 
during the time he was doing the dishes. So he looked at me and says, Papa, this is, this is the first show, two episodes. I, I really like to watch it. I said, well, Joseph, you cannot watch it because after dinner, you're going to have to do your homework. You're going to do the dishes. And Joseph, being undisciplined during that time, said, Papa, I can do it. I'll do the dishes. I'll study. I said, no, you can't do it, son. No, Papa, I cannot be late in watching this. I said, it will be replayed. Oh, no, no, no. My, my classmates will be talking about it tomorrow. I will not have anything to say. Again, he was running the wrong race. He thought school is watching TV and discussing it with the classmates. It's a wrong race. But that is what he was very concerned about. He said, my classmates will be talking about the show. And uh, I, w- I wouldn't know what to say. Please, Papa, I will do it. Well, he keep insisting. I said, okay. Now, during the time, we, we, eat, we eat like 9 p.m. Sometimes we eat like 10 p.m. So we ate and Joseph watched the show. He was very happy. 10 p.m., the show finished. Now, you just ate and the show finished. What happened? You're sleepy. So I said, Joseph, now, you got to wash the dishes. And you look at me and it dawned on him, what have I done? You know? But, you know, I, I smile. I have a certain kind of smile that they know. I said, Joseph, you've got to do the dishes now. So he, he did the dishes. He finished past 11. He said, I'm tired. I said, Joseph, you've got to do your homework. Now I sleep one, two. If I miss my sleep, I sleep at three. Even today, I sleep like that. So I'm just watching. Boy, you should see Joseph try to study. It was like a Korean praying, you know. <laughs> and it's not even Korean, you know. Was like, and I was laughing. And Joseph will look at me and say, oh, I got this, I got this. He will I got this. You know how Joseph, I got this. He'll do it. I got this. A boy around 3 a.m., he was still awake and I was still there. And finally he looked at me and said, Papa, please. Let me sleep for a couple of hours and wake me up. I said, Joseph, I can wake you up. But I said, can you wake up? He ran the wrong race. He thought it's watching TV and reviewing it with the classmates the following day. Got distracted, no discipline. But if you're going to be disciplined, you say, I sleep at this time, I do the following things. James was, I think, coming to this church the other day, uh, telling me, I have a practice for uh, harvest. I, I asked James, I said, is your homework done? No, Papa, I can do it. I said, that's not my question. Is your homework done? He said, no. So I told him, who, who told you you are going to practice? And he got sad because he likes the ministry. I said, who, who told you you are going to practice? He gave guidance. I said, okay. Because he will be in the wrong race. He wants to be a lawyer. For now. And he's going to have discipline on study. Because at this age, so I don't even like meetings in this church where kids are involved that last more than 9 p.m. Because these kids need to go to school, guys. They're not going to be a pastor. They're going to become engineers, accountants, nurses, doctors. That's the race they're running. They're not going to preach like me unless God told them. So the priority is school. Otherwise, they are running the wrong race. Are you listening? If you, if you don't know the race you are running, you will be spending tremendous amount of energy for nothing. Well, I worked hard for what? We all <clears throat> want to avoid being disqualified. Paul says, let's I disqualify myself. Alternate translation, cast away. I, I like watching documentaries. Oh, you should, you should, uh, it's sad to watch documentaries of athletes when they are on training camp 
and they're, they have high hopes. They compare themselves, I'm better than this. And then as the training camp progresses, they begin to see their weaknesses. And you begin to, to hear athletes say, I, could ha- I should have worked on this one. I should have worked. Oh, come the final day. You have to cut 10 players this, this day. And they are nervous. These are big players, nervous to look at the locker room. When they see the pink slip, they're out. They go to the coach with their playbooks, wondering, is there any other team who will pick me up? They disqualify themselves. Our goal is not to disqualify ourselves. Look, among ministers, too many ministers have run wrong races, wrong marriages, undisciplined kids, household that they did not manage well. What happened? It affects your ministry. That's why there's a lot of ministers people don't want to listen to. Because they're saying something, all noise. They are not hitting anything. Can you imagine a preacher saying, discipline your kids. You're beating the air, man. All your kids are undisciplined. You're not hitting the target. You see that? When you are saying something and you are not hitting the target, you're beating the air. And you feel like you are being drained, accomplishing nothing. But this is, this is the meaning of this metaphor. Uh, lest we cast ourselves away. Nobody is disqualifying anybody. You know. can, can you imagine if I have two wives? I can still preach in the U.S. This country is backslidden. They'll accept gay preachers here. This country is backslidden. But I'll disqualify myself. I will be running a wrong race. Okay, I'll be running a wrong race. If I will discipline myself, I'll stay in, the li- in line. It's a narrow gate. It's a narrow road. I'll stay in line. Of course, if the teams are bad, I mean, if you cannot hire any more athletes, you see this, these teams, they just, they stink. And analy- analysts are saying, why do they hire this player? Why do they hire this player? Because that's all they can hire. The best, the discipline are gone. They don't win anything. So their, their fan base curse them. Gotta live in discipline in order to win the prize. Paul's goal is also not temporary. His aim is to get the prize that only God can give. He is not out to please men but to please God. Now, there's a warning here. Too many times, Christians, in their desire to be friends with unbelievers, go too far. They have adopted unbelievers' lifestyle. Yeah, it's not going to work. Why? As a leader, you have to have that discipline that you can say no. Even if you love the brother, your friend as a brother, it's not going to work. Our problem is we want to please the people around us. We are athletes, guys. If a Christian says, I am a Christian, I don't go to nightclubs. You know what the unbelievers expect? You don't go to nightclubs. They will tempt you. But if you say no, the moment you walk away, they will admire you. You have become a witness. But you go along with them and do what they're doing after saying you're a Christian. You turn your back. They look at you and laugh and say, you're a hypocrite. Are you listening? Look, a Muslim prays, how many times a day? So they are working in the office, right? At a certain time, they lay out their mat and begin to pray towards Mecca. Does anybody criticize them? No. Why? They are Muslims. They're supposed to do that. In fact, offices even facilitates that. They have a praying room. They are expected to do that because they say they are Muslims. I was told that the Seventh-day Adventists, they are good workers, 
They tell their bosses, we don't work on Saturday. We worship on Saturday. Their bosses allow them. Why? Because they are Seventh-day Adventists. They are expected to worship on Saturday. But we are Christians. I think the world has gotten to expect that we dance. And so now when we say we live like this, when we turn around, they giggle and say, you hypocrites. Because we don't have the discipline. But this is the athletic metaphor that we are talking about. Okay, now. We are not called to run in vain. <clears throat> Galatians 5, 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? So these guys were running well. They're doing well as a marathon runner. And somebody told them, oh, you don't have to do that, those things. You don't have to do those things. What happened? They no longer obeyed the truth. I was, I was watching this uh, documentary on Peyton Manning. He got, I think he lost that year. And, and uh, he went back. I think he was from UCLA. I, I forgot, Oklahoma or UCLA. He went back to his school, went to his quarterback coach there who trained every move that he makes. And the whole summer, every day, he will be throwing thousands of football. Thousands, every day. The mechanics was perfected to the extent that his, his, uh, his palm got sore for throwing too much ball. But he got off that summer training camp perfected with a perfected throw. And he won the championship that year. What, what, what is this? This is called not playing in vain. In our walk, look, when we get born again, we say, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do the following things. Wow, we're running the good race. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, you can skip that. Hey, you, you don't have to do that. Somebody is introducing alien practices here. You know, you can, you can, that's what happened to athletes. It's, it's not that much. You can, you can do the fun. You don't have to sleep at 10. You're sleeping at 10 every day. Let's go out tonight. You can, you can, one, one, one night will not hurt you, but it damages you. It takes you off of your rhythm. And then because of adrenaline, you slept at 2 that, that morning and you found out, oh, I can perform. Now you're self-deceived. You think you can sustain it. So you started going out more often. And you realize every time you go out of your way to please the world, it's taking something from you. you stop reading your Bible. You stop praying. You still go to church. You still say amen. You still sing the songs. But you stop praying. You stop reading your Bible. You start taking your eyes off of the scriptures. You will begin at each occurrence it's taking something out of your spirituality. Until one day you're so far off. And you wonder what happened to you. What happened to you? You lost the discipline. And you are now running in vain. Philippians 2.16 Holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. We are running well when we keep on holding fast to the word of life. You know, the, the, warning, the warning that uh, the prophet issued in the Old Testament is when you are living a righteous life and you move to unrighteousness, you lose all the rewards of the past efforts. You just lo lo lose it. And so you are told to repent and do the things that you should do in the book of Revelation. But, but you know you are running well when you can hold fast. To hold fast means to cleave like, like David's mighty man. He cleaved to the sword that when the battle was over, 200 were slain or something like that, he could not take his, his, uh, his hand off, off of the, uh, I forgot, javelin or something or the sword. It froze into the handle. He fastened it. That's what well, that's the picture that Paul is trying to relate. You hold fast to the word of truth. 
You know, when you, when you hold on to, on, onto something, your, your hand freezes, and you cannot just open it out. Because, of, because it's holding, but you can grab it. You see? And I think sometimes our problem is our hold on the word is too loose. It's too loose that, that people can, can just snatch it away. They have to hold fast to it. Uh, second, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We are running well when we are taking hold of eternal life to which we are called. You know, what, what, what is sad is when, when we see fellow Christians whom we used to minister to. I had, I had a friend. He was a pastor. He opened a, he opened a, in the Philippines we call it cabaret, like a nightclub. He opened cabaret with girls and booze. He's a fellow minister. We work in the same church. Yeah. But took, took his hand, head, eyes off the, off the target. What, what is sad is when we see fellow workers in the past and they're doing nothing now. And you look at their lifestyle, it's erroneous lifestyle already. What happened? They did not get hold of eternal life. You know that, that you're running the race well because you are focused. A marathon runner normally doesn't win the marathon or, or a distance run the first, the first outing. But the first time, the first time Joseph ran, he said, there's over a thousand runners. I said, uh, what's your position? I think he's 500 and something. I was laughing. I said, I, said, I can do that in my sleep, you know. We, uh, we, we insult each other sometimes, you know. Uh, and Joseph kept uh, going at it until one day he came home very happy. Papa, I said, why? I first, I placed first in my age group. And then he relaxed. He ran again. What happened? I placed second. That's what happened. Because you, you cannot relax on that one. You see? Now he's got this goal lined up. He wants to run in all the major marathons in the world. He wants to go to Berlin. He wants to go to Israel just to run. I said, what kind of goal is that? You know, I said, go to war. You will run. You know? <laughs> or you will die. You know? Something like that. I, I, I can still understand why people go to different places just to run. You know? But that is the goal. That is, that is the aim. We have to be laser focused like that, guys. Because if we box a line, yeah, it doesn't matter if you serve God for 20 years. The Bible says you lose everything. Ours is a marathon race. We compete to win. We discipline ourselves. We make our bodies a slave. You know, even the way we eat, the way we rest, the way we dress ourselves, the way we conduct ourselves. Amen? But if we do that, we win the prize. 